This video is sponsored by Helix Sleep. When you shop with Helix, you can get your very own premium mattress that is specifically suited to your needs. There will be no hassle involved since it'll be effortlessly shipped right to your front door. Just take a couple of minutes to answer the questions on their sleep quiz to discover which of their mattresses will be the best fit for you personally. I sleep mostly on my side and my stomach, and I like it when a bed is soft without being so soft that I feel like it's like absorbing me. That information matched me with the Midnight Lux model. I've been sleeping on it like a baby for years now. It feels so luxurious and high quality, and I always wake up feeling really refreshed and like my body has been well supported throughout the night. Helix mattresses are fiberglass free, which would be something you wouldn't think you'd need to worry about, but not all mattresses are fiberglass free apparently, but you can have peace of mind with Helix. They ship for free in the US, arriving in a very convenient box. You just slide it out, unroll it, and sleep upon it. Your mattress comes with a 100 night sleep trial, so you can be completely positive that you love it. There are also financing options, flexible payment plans, as well as a 10-year warranty. If you're interested in a new bed, be sure to check out Helix Sleep. You can use the link below or head to helixsleep.com moon for a 20% discount on your Helix mattress plus two free pillows. Hello, I hope that you are doing very, very, very well tonight, tonight, tonight. I've collected a wide variety of different objects to explore with you. Let's see, what should we do first? I think I want to start with this box of tarot cards. This is the Moon Magic Deck by Dark Forest, who is an artist on Etsy. I showed this deck in a video before and I had a bunch of people asking me about it because people really like looked um, far and wide online trying to find a tarot deck with this specific style I was looking for. I can't even remember why I wanted this specific style actually. Oh, I, um, for Halloween I was going to do a 1920s Halloween party. I did one where, you know, it's a party planner, but I was gonna also do one where you're actually at the party and your friend is doing a tarot reading for you. So I wanted some cards that looked sufficiently old world and that was surprisingly difficult to find. But I like the way that these cards almost feel like they're made out of wood. Like they don't quite even feel like paper. And they look, you know, just sort sort of mermaidy. My favorites are these. This one that I have on my middle nail that looks like a shell. And then also this one on my pointer finger that looks like it's got bubbles on it. Isn't that cute? So we're gonna do a quick, very um, not legitimate tarot reading where I'm just going to have you choose between two different cards and then let you know what it means, which one that you chose. You can choose either this card, this card, this card, this card, or that card, that card, that card, that card, this card, or that card, or this card, or that card. Make your choice now. Alright, if you chose this one, then you got the moon. Oh, I lost a nail. I'll fix that in a minute. So the moon. We've got a couple of dogs gazing up in the sky. It's 
we can look up in our little guide what it means that you got the moon. So it says upright means anxiety, illusions, and fear. Reversed means repressed emotions, releasing fear, confusion. So since we didn't really do it the right way, And then if you chose the other card, that would be the three of wands. And so there's one, two, three wands surrounded by some clouds. Upright means individuality, starting a new journey, following your own path. Reversed means holding on to the past, not moving forward, and self-doubt. For our next trigger, I'm going to be clattering these orbs against one another. There's the bubble one, the triangles one, and the crater one. At some point, I'd love to do a video where we actually... I'll try to learn how to do a more legitimate tarot spread and do a real tarot reading. I used to have a friend who was really good at tarot. He learned from his mom, who was super experienced with it. So it was always really fun getting readings done by him. But to be honest, I always kind of felt like he... He was always offering to give readings to people in our friend group. And uh, as everyone does, he like loved gossip getting all the juicy details of every situation, and it almost felt like he used the tarot readings as a way to fish for that sort of thing, like, he would give a reading, pull a certain card, and then be like, so what do you think that means to you? Like, that kind of reminds me of your situation with Sarah lately, don't you think? I thought it was cool. It's one of those things that, um, even if you don't necessarily believe that anything truly magical is happening, any sort of, um, like bringing to your awareness certain ideas of, um, let's see what some of these cards are about. Disempowerment, disconnection from self, breaking free from traditions, poor communication, overcoming obstacles. Um, even if nothing truly enchanted is going on in your opinion, those ideas being brought to your attention, I think it can be helpful to take a moment to consider like, oh, poor communication, does that relate to my life in any way? Pretty much anything that the cards might say, I think there is bound to be some way that they will inevitably relate to your life in a way that could be helpful for you to be introspective on. Take some time to consider. I hope this isn't too loud. It's a bit difficult to make them clatter. Oh, I felt so bad in my last video when I showed the heatless girl technique. So many people were like, where's the results? How does it turn out? Which is so valid. I hate when people show the process and then they, show, they don't show the results. It feels like, what was all that for then? So here's the results. They didn't come out as good this time as they have in the past. I think I took them out too early. My hair was still ever so slightly damp when I took them out. So the curls fell quite a bit. So it's more of a gentle wave kind of style. Which I'm not mad about. I think it looks cute. I'm happy with it. But there have been times where I left it in until my hair really truly was bone dry. And then the curls 
are so bouncy and amazing. For our next trigger. Oh, I like that. I like that so much. We have this flip flop. Brown flip flop by the brand Yellow Box with a sunflower logo. I'm not much of a flip flop person, but I got these because I was doing a Princess Peach cosplay, specifically a Juicy Couture, couture tracksuit, like Y2K Princess Peach cosplay. And I wasn't sure what footwear would best suit a tracksuit when I looked up photos of Lindsay Lohan and Paris Hilton from the early 2000s they were usually wearing the tracksuit with either some white sneakers or some glittery flip-flops So I picked these up for that, for that, for that. And I wore that outfit to Anime Expo. And a lot of people were really nice about it. I got a lot of compliments. I thought it was so funny. There was even this girl who, you know how the juicy track suits, they say bejeweled juicy on the butt? across the cheeks. Um, it's a big part of the charm of the track scene is that cheeky little slogan. Um, so this girl came up to me and she asked for my picture and she was like, sorry if this is weird, it's totally fine if you don't want to, but do you think I could get a picture where like, I, I can see the juicy on your butt? <laughs> I was like, yeah, sure. And I really wish that I would have exchanged contact info with her so she could have sent me the picture. Because I ended up completely forgetting to get a picture that day where the juicy was visible. Like any pictures on my phone. I'm sad about that. It's always really surprisingly difficult to remember to get good photos whenever I've done any sort of cosplay or gone out in any kind of special look. I always have every intention to get great photos to commemorate the occasion and then I always forget or I just end up with like a couple blurry badly lit photos you're just too busy having fun with other things which is nothing to complain about It just feels like life passes by so quickly. I, it's so difficult to recall the happy memories unless you've documented them. I hope you like this sound. I've been doing it quite a while because I really like it. I thought that this trigger was going to be more about this sort of sound. I was at that anime expo with the peach. I was waiting in line with my boyfriend and my friends to get a drink at the after party. The after party was so much fun. Um, but there was this guy who was standing in line in front of us who struck up conversation with me. And I chatted with him for a bit. And then he asked if he could buy me a drink. Obviously, I'm always going to be happy for someone else to pay for something for me. Like, that's wonderful. <laughs> what an offer. But, um, I do think there is a sort of unspoken social contract that once you accept a drink, it's not like it's written in stone that you have to hook up with the person or anything, obviously, but there is a bit of an, like, if you say yes, then what you're communicating is, I'm down to spend some time flirting with you at the very least. And I was there with my boyfriend, so I just said like, oh, I'm sorry, I don't think my boyfriend would appreciate that, but thank you. Um, and I hated having to say that 
because I just, I never want to make anybody feel rejected or embarrassed or anything. And I could tell that he felt a bit, you know, and he was there with his friends, so I felt like I embarrassed him in front of his friends. But he, he reached out his head and he shook my hand, which I thought was funny and sweet. A gesture of goodwill. He was trying to show me, like, no hard feelings, I think. But, yeah, he was dressed up as Tanjiro. right earrings and everything. Another time that somebody bought me a drink, the the bartender gave it to me like I was at a, a show, a music show, and um, the bartender came up to me and she handed me a drink. I think she just said, this is for you. So I assumed that she was the one hitting on me. But that was not the case. A few minutes later, this guy came up to me and he was like, did you like the drink? So I was like, oh, okay. So I think she was probably supposed to say this is from him and point him out to me, but she didn't. But yeah, he was nice. At that time I was single, so I did, you know, chat with him for a bit, but we didn't really have much chemistry. So that was that. But very nice of him. I think that buying somebody a drink is a sweet gesture. I, I do, I do like that as a method of approaching someone. As long as you don't have too heavy of expectations along with it. This is um, my boyfriend's sketchbook that I pulled as a trigger item for this video just because I wanted to show you these sketches he did for me for my uh, Lily Folly Academy video for the candy shop. He came up with some ideas for me to potentially use for enchanted candies. This is a cloud bunny candy. His ideas for the effects were can make you bounce high, no fall damage, can give you double jump, Tastes like marshmallow, vanilla, or cotton candy. Then there was the giggle clown. Makes you laugh nonstop. Makes you experience all emotions at once. Makes you happy. The flavors could be tutti fruity, licorice, maybe swaps flavors. I love this one. All three of these designs are adorable. you see forest spirits, lets you talk to plants, makes animals like you, can taste like, oh, the outside tastes like chocolate, dark or milk, the inside filling tastes like maple, honey, or almond. I wish that was real so bad, that sounds really good. And then, these remind me of calcifer. These are so cute, I love these designs. Angor's firecrackers Makes skin hot to the touch Enough to light a candle Makes fingertips shoot fireworks or sparkle Attunes you to fire Making fire spells easier to learn or cast They can taste spicy like chamoy, tamarind, cinnamon, pop rocks and Then the grim drops Very poisonous Maybe paralyzers, maybe kills, suppresses magic use, turns organs to stone, tastes bitter, like licorice, or hound lump, earthy, matcha, coffee. I don't think I've told you guys before about whorehound lumps. No, Luna Bloom ASMR and her wife Ronnie. Once I uh, went to an old fashioned candy shop. And there were these candies that were so ugly. They were these little dark brown hard candies that looked a bit dusty, like grayish on the outside. And we were so intrigued by their name, Whorehound Lumps. Whorehound Lumps. 
Um, so we got them just to try them. They tasted sort of like root beer, but not as not as good as root beer. It was such a funny candy. And the last one is Illusion Lollipops. This one that's like a ring pop, but a hand is pretty neat. This one's cute. Cast illusion related spells. Makes whoever licks it take on the appearance of the last licker. Turns liquor into spectral dust. Gain all the memories of the last liquor since they licked. Makes liquor see nightmares until someone else licks. Tastes like blue raspberry, mint, sour, or bomb blast. And then it looks like he started on some Halloween-y ones but didn't finish. This reminds me of Over the Garden Wall. And I like this concept of the candy corn, but it's like it's got a witch hat on top. That's a good idea. I wanted to bring back the hair curler because I was just so obsessed with the sound this makes. Oh, I have another anecdote I wanted to share from that anime expo after party. I was there with Raven, also known as Busy Bee. Busy Bee is more. I was there with her and the ASMR Ryan, her partner. And on the dance floor, there is this guy who was so profoundly drunk. When we first noticed him, he was dancing a little ways behind us, and he looked like he was really struggling to stay upright, like he kept on almost falling over, and then catching his balance again. And then eventually he started dancing up on people really aggressively, like grinding on random people. They clearly did not appreciate it that much. And then eventually he closed in on Ryan, and Ryan was trying to kind of block him from getting to me and Raven. So he was like, kind of throwing himself his full body weight up against Ryan. And Ryan was like stumbling forward, almost falling over from this guy, like body slamming him again and again grinding up on him and the guy was even like shouting so loud like ay, 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 like so loud um and none of us really knew what to do but then Raven really saved the day and it was such a cool thing to witness because she was dressed as Makima from Chainsaw Man so, you know, like in the suit and tie with the sleek red hair and the ponytail, she looked so cool. And without saying anything, she just like struts through the crowd, like speed walks, cuts through the crowd, goes over to security. There are some security guards up um, by the entrance. She told them what was going on. So then a couple of security guards came over and I thought their technique for handling it was so funny. I'm sure that they are well versed in corralling techniques for overly inebriated people and they know that if you say like to someone who's having a, a ton of fun and is super wasted hey party's over you've got to get out they're gonna get aggressive probably and things are gonna get ugly so instead these two very intense intimidating looking security guards are dancing come up to this guy, this belligerent guy, and start dancing with him. Dancing up against him in a way where they're pushing him closer and closer to the exit as they're dancing. And they eventually just sort of guide him out of the venue just by dancing him away. And the whole time he's like, yeah, like vibing with them, thinking like, oh, finally, some people are walking with me. And I just thought it was so cool that that Raven did that. She knew how to handle the situation and, and protect us. Because we did need protecting. Like, this guy, he at one point, there was this girl on the dance floor who was very scantily clad. She was in this cute, like, cat girl bikini type costume. And he came up to her and kept on, like, accidentally grazing his hand against her butt. Like, making it look like he was just So yeah, he had to go. So I'm glad Raven handled it. Afterwards, in the car, my boyfriend was like, oh, I'm so glad Raven handled it. I was thinking that I 
that that's like such a part of um, guys sort of psyche in a way I don't know, hearing about guys consider getting into physical altercations with people is always so jarring to me to hear about that like I can't believe that even occurs to you watching um, Trixie and Kachi's podcast the other day when I was driving back from LA. I love listening to a podcast on a long drive. It makes it go by so much faster. And Kachi was talking about her first experiences with ASMR. And she mentioned that one of them was when she was in grade school. She had a math teacher with a really droning, kind of monotone voice. And as he was trying to explain math concepts to her, she was getting tingles all over her scalp, down her arms. Do you remember your first experiences with ASMR? I know that I did experience it when I was a child. to each other's houses all the time and we loved to play this game where one by one we would take turns one of us had to leave the room while all the rest of us schemed about the kind of experience we were going to give them to guide them through so we would decide like okay they're gonna be we're gonna guide them through the jungle and we would when we would bring them in be blindfolded and we would have set up like a bunch of pillows to push them onto and be like oh you're falling into quicksand and then we would like throw a blanket over them and rub the blanket all over them and be like you're sinking deeper and deeper into the quicksand but then uh, somebody comes and saves you and one of us would come lift them up and then we would be like and then a tiger attacks you and we would have a stuffed animal prepared to come pounce on them say, and then it starts raining and we would all like to be tippy tap tippy tap all over them or something so we would just guide them all around their room blindfolded through this setup of this like immersive experience we'd prepared the one that I most remember is the like through the jungle, there were so many others I don't recall, but that was always so much fun, and I remember being the one blindfolded from start to finish, it was always such an incredibly experience for me. Just the combination of like the uncertainty and the mystery and the like audio and tactile stimulation um, was really wonderful. And like the personal attention aspect of it too, I'm sure. Something about multiple people I've got this little baby pink 
heart-shaped measuring tape. Maybe I'll take some measurements for you. From eye to This weekend, I went to a rave in LA. It was a lot of fun. I danced a lot. I, my knees and my calves have been so sore ever since because I'm just, I'm not used to dancing and especially not the super bouncy, jumpy style of dancing I was doing. I normally am like way too hesitant and shy. the style of music for most of the night I was really, really vibing with it, so I sort of got lost in it and was actually able to not think about people looking at me and judging me for once. So it was super fun. This is a ruched headband. It says wash and prep spa head wrap. Reversible. with people or having people that I can hang out with on a regular basis. Like, I don't know, it just sounds like the most fulfilling thing ever to me to be able to regularly have a, like a group of people over to play board games or video games or host like a themed dinner party and like I can cook for everyone and I just don't really have enough people in my life to those kinds of things happen. And like everybody always talks about, it's just hard as an adult and especially as a somewhat introverted adult to make that happen. And my boyfriend is a lot better than I am about striking up conversations with people. It definitely helps when you're wearing something unique. It makes you more approachable. At the Dorian concert, I was wearing my calico critter necklace that I made and that got a few compliments but once somebody tells me they like it I just like I get so nervous and I don't know what to say next I don't know what to say after that 
I feel like, I don't know, the most fulfilling part of life is in our personal relationships with other people. You know, sharing your talents and kindness with other people. And other people sharing their talents and kindness with you. Supporting one another. And it just kind of, to me, feels like it's the whole point. Everybody, you know how like in The Sims, there's the aspirations you can choose? I don't remember what any of them are. I think one of them is making as much money as possible. There's so many. But, I don't know, I think there's a lot of people who feel most driven by being very successful and really optimizing their life to spend every minute as much as possible in such a way that they will, you know, achieve. Like, some people are very ambitious, and as I'm getting older, I think I'm really realizing that I am not that way. I really just crave um, spending time with people and getting to know people and showing them kindness helping improve their lives and making each other laugh and finding each other's thoughts and opinions interesting. But as somebody who is really um, anxious and I feel like I, my whole life, have been stuck with an extremely loud voice in my head that is always telling me that everything I do and say is wrong. That makes it really exhausting to communicate with and be around people. The sound on the body of this purse is a bit intense. It's very Do a little bit of dual lens tapping on both the glasses and the lens because a lot of you really liked it in my recent lens tapping video. At the Dorian Electric. 
concert, I was somewhat close to the front, and at one point people started moshing. I've never really moshed before, so I was trying to back up to get out of the, the action zone, but I couldn't really. A lot of people were crashing up onto me, but it was fun. boyfriend was very much in the thick of it though and he broke his glasses moshing is such a, a such a funny activity it just makes so much sense to me that it's something people would want to do to get some rough housing out of their system and there's something sort of sweet about way and just all have this mutual understanding that you're all gonna you know let off some steam by going crazy but you're also all gonna look out for each other make sure no one gets hurt Earlier today, I kind of panicked because I couldn't find one of the cats. I've got two cats, Quite G is the white one, and Mimi's, or Marceline, is the black one. And I've been really worried about them ever since a few weeks ago. Marceline got outside. She used her paw to, she reached her paw around the edge and opened it, wandered outside. Eventually, I, I realized I hadn't seen her in a while, and we were looking all over for her, and eventually we found her in the backyard, sitting in the dirt, wide-eyed, just looking around, not sure what to make of this big to before. We brought her back inside thinking our lucky stars that she didn't get eaten by any coyotes or wander off too far or anything like that. And ever since then, I've been super vigilant about making sure all the doors always stay completely closed. But now it makes me so nervous whenever I haven't seen one of them in a while. I'm so scared that that's happened again. So I was looking all over for him. Eventually, we found him in the bathroom, in the upper cabinet full of towels, and I'm so baffled at how he managed to get in there because I don't know how he would have opened up the top cabinet, jumped up there, and then closed it behind him. He was so pleased with himself. I think it's so funny when the cats crawl into the cabinet. It's like it's their own little proportional to their size. If I was a cat, I sure would love to hang out in a cabinet. But now I'm glad that I know that that's one of his spots. I have these white crocs. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. 10, 11, glow in the dark stars. Which color star is your favorite? Is it the purple? The purple? Or could it be the pink? Or the peach? The yellow? Or is that orange? Yeah, that's orange. I think the other reason I had so much more fun than usual dancing at the rave this weekend was that I was wearing a pair of pink My Melody slippers 
and in the past when I've gone out uh, to this rave, I've worn like demonias, and by the end of the night, my feet are killing me, so I'm not as inclined to want to bounce around. But in slippers, the world was my oyster, dancing wise. I could not have been more comfortable. It's like I was, you know, jumping around on clouds. It was amazing. So in the future, I'm definitely going to make quite the effort to choose an outfit that I will be able to match with a pair of slippers. Oh, this is such a good sound. I love it. bummed though because Aaliyah interlude, the one who does it girl I-T-G-I-R-L you know I am that girl, it girl from ETL, she was performing and I missed it because there's several different rooms that people are performing in different DJs and artists will be performing in at any given time and I just wasn't paying attention to the clock and I wasn't in the right Still super fun. Oh, don't you just want to gobble those up? Grape flavor, pear flavor, or green apple? Blue raspberry, cantaloupe, not orange. I don't like orange flavored candy. It's cantaloupe. Uh, lychee. so excited to go to the Ren Fair again this year. I, um, there's a themed weekend. A couple themed weekends. There's the pirate themed weekend, which I went to last year. And then there's also a cottagecore themed weekend, which I think I might go to. some felt peeling and I'll probably stay quiet during this part because it's such a subtle sound I don't want you to miss it for the sake of my blabbering oh but you know I'm working on this. I want you to be thinking about a, um, you've been invited to a royal ball and your outfit has to be made from one of these colors and the ball is going to be taking place in April. So think about that and I'll think about it too. I'll let you know which color I'm picking at the end.
Did you make your choice? I'm thinking for me either this color or this color. Which do you think will look better on me? This one. Imagine the gown. What do you think? This one or that one? I think I like this one better. I feel like this color looks so fresh and lively against my complexion and my hair. But this is so pretty. Such an elegant shade. So I don't know. Isn't that felt sound heavenly? I love it so much. You know, I want to do a bit of a typing sound. So I think I'll ask you some questions so I can type down your replies. I'd like you to think about your day today, or if it's morning for you, think about your day yesterday. And tell me what was your favorite part of your day today or yesterday. Mm-hmm. you rather receive a complimentary back rub or a scalp massage every day? Mm -hmm. Good choice. Alright, thank you so much for those answers from the complete Secret Staircase. I'm intrigued by that. Let's do that one. I want to know what the Secret Staircase is all about. So I'm going to shift your gaze downwards so you can see the illustrations properly. The Secret Staircase. Got to my huddled up in blankets here. It was a frosty morning. The air was crisp and cold, and everything sparkled in the winter sunshine. 
The little mice hurrying along the path turned up their collars and blew on their paws in an effort to keep warm. <sighs> Merry Midwinter, panted Dusty Dogwood, scurrying past Mr. Apple and the Toad Flax children with a huge covered basket. Mr. Apple and the children were busy too, dragging great sprays of holly and trails of ivy and mistletoe towards the old oak palace. When they arrived at the gates, they heaped all the branches on the ground, and Wilfred tugged on the bell. Lord Woodmouse and Primrose, his daughter, opened the door. Here we are. Here we are. Here we are, said Mr. Apple, mopping his face. Do you want it all inside? Yes, please, said Lord Woodmouse. We'll start by decorating the stairs. Eagerly, the children pulled the branches over the polished palace floors and skidded their way into the great hall. Are you two ready for tonight? asked Lord Woodmouse. Primrose and Wilfred exchanged glances. That evening, after dark, all the mice would gather round a blazing fire for the traditional midwinter celebrations. A grand entertainment was planned, and Primrose and Wilfred had chosen to give a recitation. Almost, said Primrose, but we've still got to practice, and we need proper costumes. You'd better see your mother about those, replied her father. You can practice wherever you like. Leaving Clover, Catkin, and Teasel to go back to the wood with Mr. Apple, Primrose and Wilfred took themselves off to a corner of the hall and began to go through their lines. When the days are the shortest, the nights are the coldest, began Primrose, drawing an imaginary cloak around her. The frost is the sharpest, the year is the oldest, continued Wilfred. Look out, you two, interrupted Basil, bustling past with some bottles. This is hopeless, sighed Primrose. We can't rehearse here. Let's go and ask Mama what to do. Lady Woodmouse was busy making caraway biscuits in the kitchen. She leaned on her rolling pin to listen to Primrose's tale of woe. Why don't you see if there's something up in the attics for you to wear, she said. You could practice up there, too. She packed a little basket with bread and cheese and a jug of blackberry juice and shooed the children gently out of the kitchen. There were a great many attic rooms at the top of the old oak palace. Lady Woodmouse used them to tidy away things that might come in useful. Babies' blankets and rolls of lace boxes of buttons, stacks of books, broken toys, patchwork quilts, pudding cloths, and old saucepans were all crammed together, higgledy-piggledy, on the shelves. Primrose and Wilfred went from room to room looking for a suitable spot for their rehearsal. They ended up in a crowded storeroom at the end of a passage. But it was difficult to concentrate on practicing. There were so many things to look at. Standing on tiptoe, Primrose reached inside the drawer of an old wooden dresser. In it, she found some bundles of letters tied up in pink ribbon. But she couldn't read the writing. And as it's rude to read other people's letters, she put them back. And as she did so, she caught sight of a small key which had slipped down at the side of the drawer. Look at this, Wilfred, she cried excitedly. Let's see. Oh, it's only an old key, said Wilfred. Is it time for lunch? Primrose said nothing, but she slipped the key into her pinafore pocket before setting out their picnic on the floor. Do you think this would make a cloak? said Wilfred, his mouth full of bread and cheese. He had seized the end of a long green curtain and was winding himself up in it. 
As he turned towards Primrose, he caught sight of a small door hidden behind its folds. Where does this go to, Primrose? he asked. I don't know, replied Primrose, scrambling over some boxes. Does it open? Wilfred pushed. The door was locked. He peeped through the keyhole and saw another flight of stairs on the other side of the door. It's no good, he said disappointedly. We can't get in. If there's a keyhole, there must be a key, said Primrose, and I think I have it here. She reached inside her pinafore pocket and handed the little key to Wilfred. He tried it in the lock. It fitted perfectly, and the door swung open. They found themselves in a dark paneled hall at the foot of a long, winding staircase. The stair carpet must once have been beautiful, but now it was tattered and covered with dust. No one can have been up here for years and years, whispered Primrose. Shall we see what's at the top? Wilfred nodded, so up the stairs they went, round and round. Primrose kept close behind Wilfred. She couldn't help feeling a little nervous. Suddenly, the stairs came to an abrupt end. They were standing in yet another hall and there ahead was yet another door, but this time it was huge and richly carved. They went up to it, and Wilfred gave it a push. As the door opened, the children stared about them in amazement. They were standing in the most magnificent room. There were columns and carvings, and dark tapestries and paintings on the walls. smelled musty and strange. Where are we? asked Wilfred. I don't know, whispered Primrose. I've never been here before. They tiptoed across the floor, leaving footprints as they went. Maybe your ancestors lived here in the olden days, Primrose, said Wilfred, gazing at an imposing portrait. Let's clean it all up and have it as our house, said Primrose. We could keep it secret and come up here to play. As she spoke, she opened a cupboard and found it full of hats. Wilfred, look at these. They're just right for tonight. A door at the end of the room led into a nursery. There was a canopied cot near the window, and all sorts of dust-covered toys were on the shelves. Wilfred peered inside an ancient trunk pulled out a little suit with a high jacket and tight braided trousers. It was almost the right size for him. Neatly folded beneath it were dresses and cloaks, waistcoats and shawls, some trimmed with gold and others studded with shining stones. The children held them up one after another and each chose an outfit for the evening and tried it on. Perfect. And now we must practice. Let's finish exploring first, said Wilfred. They seemed to be in a whole suite of rooms. There was a dining room, a butler's pantry, a small kitchen, and several other bedrooms. The bathroom was particularly grand, with a tiled floor and high windows. Wilfred rubbed a mirror clean and made faces at himself whilst Primrose leaned over the side of the bath to try the taps. No water came out. When the days are the shortest, the nights are the coldest, she recited. Her voice sounded loud and echoey. Wilfred joined in, and they went through their lines again and again until they were word perfect. Outside, the red sun was sinking low in the frosty air, and the bathroom was filled with shadows. It's getting late, said Primrose. If we don't hurry, we'll miss the log. They picked up their clothes and scampered over the dusty floors to the door. Down the stairs they ran, round and round, down and down, till they found themselves back in the storeroom. They locked the door with the little key and replaced it in the 
drawer. Then they crept along the corridors to Primrose's room. Taking care to keep out of sight, Primrose opened her window. They could just hear the caroling of the mice as the midwinter log was pulled along the hedge. There was no time to change, so they threw on their cloaks to hide their costumes and ran to join the crowd at the palace gates. Mr. Apple and Dusty Dogwood headed the procession, lanterns held high. Rose the chestnuts heat the wine, pass the cups along the line, gather round the log burns bright, it's warm as toast inside tonight, sang the mice as the log came into view. Teasel, Clover, and Catkin were perched on the huge branch, and as it was dragged up to the palace gates, Primrose and Wilfred scrambled up behind. The mice pulled the log carefully over the threshold, and Basil threw some bramble wine onto the park. Merry midwinter, he called. At last the log was here. The midwinter celebrations could begin. The fire had been laid ready in the hearth the great hall, and the log was rolled onto it. Everyone was handed a cup of steaming punch. Old Mrs. Eyebright was to light the fire, and she held up a burning taper. To summer, she announced, and Mr. Apple stooped to help her thrust the taper into the fire. To summer, echoed the mice. The bright flames licked the mossy bark, and soon the log was ablaze. The mice helped themselves to supper, which was spread on a table near the fire, and Basil refilled their cups. Why don't you take off your cloak, dear? said Lady Woodmouse. It's very hot here by the fire. Not just yet, Mama, said Primrose. I'm still a bit chilly. When they had eaten all they could, they drew their chairs up around the hearth, and the entertainment began. Mr. Apple made huge shadows on the wall by standing in front of the fire. He made the shape of a weasel with a mean little eye, and a snake's head, a fox, and with the aid of a curtain, a bat. The little mice squealed and laughed. Next, Basil played a jig on his fiddle, and Dusty did some conjuring tricks. Then they tried to pass a crab apple right round the circle, holding it under their chins. And after that, Lord Woodmouse told stirring tales of olden times. Primrose and Wilfred nudged each other. Everyone did a turn until at last Lord Woodmouse said, And now, Primrose, what have you got for us? The children jumped up and took their places in front of the fire. Drawing their cloaks closely around them, they began. When the days are the shortest, the nights are the coldest. The frost is the sharpest, the year is the oldest. The sun is the weakest, the wind is the hardest. The snow is the deepest, the skies are the darkest. Then polish your whiskers, and tidy your nest, and dress in your richest, and finest, and best. For winter has brought you the worst it can bring, and now it will give you the promise of spring. Primrose and Wilfred threw off their cloaks and donned their hats with a flourish. The audience gasped to see the beautiful clothes which sparkled in the firelight, and then clapped and cheered louder than ever. The applause went on for so long that Lord Woodmouse had to ask them to do it all over again. At last, Primrose and Wilfred went back to their seats. That was wonderful, whispered Lady Woodmouse, hugging her. Wherever did you find those beautiful clothes? Primrose glanced quickly at Wilfred. In the attic, she mumbled, hoping that her mother would not ask any more awkward questions. Luckily, at that moment, Basil started to tell one last story, and everyone
everyone settled down to listen. Primrose and Wilfred gazed at the fire and thought of all the lovely games they would play in their house at the top of the secret staircase. Soon their heads began to nod, and in no time at all, they were both fast asleep. I hope that you enjoyed that Brambly Hedge story. I thought that was really cute. The last trigger I want to leave you with tonight is just a bit of tapping on my Lucky charm sweater. On the star, the rainbow, the heart, the horseshoe, the shooting star, the moon, the hut, the balloon, the clover. Do you like the tapping sound? really